they spoke to people who were literally working as pastors, but who no longer believed in God. And it was just, it's not a survey. It's not a a, a thing that you're going to say, well, we can estimate there are 15% of pastors who don't know. It's just saying, these are like five people we spoke to. They are currently working. We're using fake names because they don't want to be caught, but they don't believe in God. So why don't they believe in God? How are they dealing with this when they deliver a sermon every week, which is fascinating. And once they published that, I think they heard from more people who were like, wait a minute, I'm in that same boat. And that eventually led to the formation of a group called The Clergy Project. Give some background on what has brought you to you know your your work, your activism today. I, my understanding is that you were raised as a Jane, um, but I'd love to give you an opportunity to just maybe kick the conversation off with some background. Yeah, uh, I, I was raised Jane, J-A-I-N. It's a religion that kind of centers around nonviolence, which mm. sounds lovely. And it gets, I think, unearned credit for being like a good religion. But it it believes in a lot of supernatural stuff, karma, reincarnation, heaven, hell, things like that. So uh, it's not any more correct. Um, and even in terms of the nonviolence, uh, which, again, sounds great. They do also have rituals that can get disturbing when it comes to fasting and the amount of it and the level of it and how young you are when you do it, things like that, that could be problematic. But in any case, I came to atheism and activism. Uh, I'll try to keep it short, but basically when I started questioning my faith, this is early high school for me. Um, you know, it, it's something I did internally. There wasn't a lot of, there were not a lot of options online to kind of mm. figure this stuff out, unless you're talking about websites written by clearly shady people in their basements <laughs> on like AOL dial up. So it's not like there was a big community. It's something I feel like I figured out on my own without the help of books that later became popular organizations that are literally geared to helping people like me at the time. But once I figured it out in my own head, the more I thought about it, the more I read about it, whatever I could find, it just confirmed that, yeah, I think I'm right about this atheism thing. In college, I actually tried to find groups uh, to for people like me. I wanted to talk about this more. I was a little more open about it in a way I had not been. Um, and I, long story short, I, I happened to meet someone who was actually involved in like this atheist burgeoning atheist movement like she volunteered at camp quest which is still around which is a summer camp for children of atheist parents um and she just exposed me to this whole world of activism i didn't know about she mm. suggested not only we start a group which we did at our campus but to become affiliated with the secular student alliance which is still around and the center for inquiry which is still around um and so that was my little foray into atheist activism and it wasn't long before I joined the board of the Secular Student Alliance. I got to know, oh, there's this new group. They're helping launch the Secular Coalition for America, which is still around, which is doing lobbying for these issues. What are atheist issues when it comes to lobbying? Like, are we lobbying for more atheists? The answer is no. Hmm. But it's like, oh, there's all these issues they care about that are so separate than the God question that has been on my mind for so long. And, you know, uh, I did that for a number of years. It was kind of cool to be on the inside of the nonprofit cause-based world. And then cut to some years later, I was in grad school, wasn't happy with what I was doing, took time off, kind of had to rethink what I was doing with my life. And along the way, I'm like, I have free time in a way I really haven't had in a long time. And on a whim, it's like, you know what I would like to do? If I had all the time in the world, which I now have, it's I kind of want to go visit all these churches that I read about but never attended. I wanted to, I mean, not just a Christian one, like various types of Christian ones, a mosque, a synagogue. I've never been to any of them outside maybe a wedding or something like that. And so I put up on eBay, like I will go to a place wherever the highest bidder wants me to go which I'm pretty sure would get flagged now as a scam or something. But uh, <laughs> but a pastor won the auction, and he actually was well-versed in Christianity as far as like the sociological study of it. And he said, you know, technically, I owed him 
like a year's worth of Sunday services. He Mm -hmm. said, no, because I I would love it if you are not an atheist by the end of this. And nothing will keep you an atheist like going to a church every week. (laughs) So he said, tell you what, he knew the landscape in Chicago, even though he wasn't from there and said, why don't you go to an evangel a white evangelical mega church go to a black church on the south side of chicago go to a dude's living room cuz that is how a lot of churches form get a taste of everything and in exchange i'll write about those experiences on that dude's ministries website and that kind of led me uh again i'm trying to keep it short but uh it was a learning experience it was great there were things i saw and heard in those churches that were not theological but which i very much agreed with Um, There were things they did that I'm like, I could see how this could brainwash people. I could see how you could get sucked into this culture, um, even if it sounds good on the surface. But the interaction I had with people writing about that experience, hearing from atheists and Christians who were like, this is why I left church, or you're misunderstanding what they're trying to do. That was a very cool type of, I mean, it's nascent blogging, basically what I was doing. And the Mm -hmm. Com- the community that formed was interesting. Like I learned a lot from reading those comments. And so after that experiment was over, I wrote a book kind of doing the same thing, but it got me thinking, I I like the idea of sharing my thoughts on these things, church going, but like all things religion. Mm. And so I started doing that. Um, and that formed, uh, that's kind of what I'm doing today. Uh, FriendlyAtheist.com. I write about religion and politics and church state stuff. Not so much trying to convert people to atheism. I could care less about that. Mm. But more about like, these are religious related issues that are going on. I have an opinion about it. So I'm going to put it out there. Mm. And, you know, if you do this forever, you'll get a following of sorts. Yeah. Sorry for that long answer. <laughs> no, that was great. And I, I know that I want to get into the activism work and the Secular Co- Coalition for America work as well at, at some point in the in uh, this conversation. Yeah. But for you personally, when you were leaving religion, was that something that was particularly difficult for you? I know we've had these conversations over the years about yeah. um, and have been involved in communities trying to offer support for people who are really losing the foundation many times of their life. Right. How, how was that experience for you personally? I mean, in hindsight, I could say it was easy because uh, there was no threat of excommunication. There was no worry that I was going to lose everyone in my life, which some people do have to go through. I think the biggest thing I was worried about is disappointing my parents. But guess what? It turns out I do that all the time <laughs> outside of religion, too. So it wasn't that big of a deal. I didn't tell them for a long time. So this is something I struggled with internally because I thought that if you stop believing in God, you might be a bad person or become a Mm. bad person. And it took me a while to figure out, no, you don't need God to keep you in line like that. Um, But over in terms of was it difficult? No, I had to get comfortable with it on my own. But after I did, it wasn't that difficult in terms of my family and stuff. eh, We slow rolled it. You know, Mm. I, I told them at some point. But if you ask them today, like, what do I do all day? I don't think they could give you an answer. I don't (laughs) think they have any idea. Um, And they've just come to the understanding that I disagree on the religion thing, but we don't talk about it to keep the peace. Mm. Um, Otherwise, we have a good relationship. So, like, it's not as bad as it could have been. Yeah. I know just from my understanding of your biography, I, I think of you mostly as a teacher, yeah. Because I know you were a teacher, you were a math teacher, you were saying before we started recording that you are still involved in coaching. Yeah. And, you know, when you made that switch and got comfortable with this atheist worldview for you, did that change you in some fundamental way, your outlook, your behavior, or or not really? I mean, in a sense, when I was in grad school trying to figure out, you know, I wasn't happy, what do I do with my life? I, I mean... I'm not going to say I made this change because of atheism, but I think part of me was like, I only have this one life. Why am I doing something that's not making me happy? Yeah. Um, And I mean, I did eventually make that shift of dropping out of grad school temporarily and then later permanently and switching to a different like court degree course. I mean, Mm -hmm. that was a couple of years of awkwardness and like, what the hell am I doing? 
I mean, I don't want to revisit that time in my life like mm-hmm. right now. But ultimately, I could say like, I feel like that was the right move for me at the time. But so it did impact me in that sense. And it wasn't just I'm not happy with pursuing grad school on the path that I was going down. It's I started working with those groups I mentioned, those nonprofit atheist groups. And I'm like, I'm really passionate about this. But no one in my life circle has ever told me nonprofit work was a future or Mm -hmm. that, you know, anything else that wasn't medicine, which is what I was doing, is really possible. And it's like, besides the nonprofit activist world, like, I could probably do just fine going into teaching. And then I would also have a little more time relative to medicine to pursue all these other interests I have, which I'm suppressing right now, because I was in grad school trying to focus on that. So in that sense, like, it wasn't just the philosophical, I have one life, even Mm. though that was a part of it. It was the, I found something I'm super passionate about. I love reading these books that are Mm. slowly starting to come out. This is early 2000s before the new atheist stuff. But it's like, I love reading those books. I like reading about that stuff online. I like having these discussions and talking about it. It didn't seem like now where Christian nationalism is lurking around every corner. It just Mm. felt like, oh, this is a silly thing that I think I could convince people not to do. I was interested in that. And so the fact that I could be involved in a movement that was working toward those goals and give more time to it because I like that stuff Mm -hmm. while also pursuing a career that wasn't going to make me go crazy, those seem that seemed like a win win. Yeah. And I don't know if you remember that time particularly clearly, given that it's been, you know, quite a while while now. But were, were, do you remember there being arguments or essays or books that were particularly formative that really, you know, really firmly convinced you or planted the, you know, non-religious slash atheist flag in your brain? God, I wish I wish I had stuff to suggest. The answer is no, because there wasn't a book that changed my mind on this stuff, probably because books written for lay people about atheism and philosophy just weren't there, or at least I didn't know about them if they were there. Um, So when I say like I was reading shady websites on like AOL dial up, that's not an exaggeration. There were people who were writing about religion. Um, There's a name Cliff Walker that I remember from like the late 1990s who Mm. had a blog. I don't know if the dude is alive. I never Mm. got to know him or anything like that. But I remember he wrote about atheism. I'm like, everything this guy writes seems to make sense. Mm. And like, there's nothing out there like that. Now there are tons. I would, I'm so half jealous that today there are YouTubers who can talk about this stuff so openly and not just talk about atheism, but like, I'm an ex fundamentalist Christian. Let me tell you about why this thing that's going on is so troublesome. I'm an ex Mormon. I'm an ex Jehovah's Witness. Like, they're so good at it Mm. and they know their stuff. And to have someone like that, would have been life-changing had that existed. Um, The same is true for podcasts. The same is true to an extent with the books. The problem for me, like with the Dawkins books, those new atheism books, is even though they are helpful to a lot of people, they paint religion with a broad brush because they have to, because they're books written for like everybody. So like, yeah, they take, I don't even want to say cheap shots. They describe religion as like, this is what everyone believes. This is how people think about this stuff. And I think there are plenty of religious people who would say, no, it's more nuanced than that for me. So I don't buy any of this description of what my people are like, Mm. um, which is a fair criticism. But like you're writing a book that's this many pages, you can't get into nuance necessarily. So the fact that now there are people writing or talking with nuance about their experiences, like I wish that were around when I was coming into this stuff, because I I don't know if it would have changed me at all, but I think that would have helped because I had to go searching for whatever. There was a lot of crap. There still is, mm-hmm. but I it was a different time. Uh, that was yeah. a large reason why I wanted to put together that compendium personally. Is that it, yeah. it really became the book I wish I would have had when I was fifteen. Yes. Yeah, um, that's and... so much of what I do now, which is I know there are people who write about. Uh, politics. Obviously, there are religion reporters I really admire who cover these things. What I'm interested in is, oh, this is the thing that is happening right now. Also, 
as an atheist, here's how you ought to think about it, because you should be as mad as I am about this thing or that thing. Mm. Um, and if it's not out there, OK, then I'll write it out there and maybe someone will connect. And that's true of anything I do online. This is a, a huge reason why I was so excited to talk to you is because I know you are still deep in these waters and are familiar with a lot of the goings on in the secular world and the overreach of religious communities into secular society. And I, I'd love to give a little bit of space, and I'm sure I know how much you post, and there are so many different issues that you flag and make public. Um, but if, if we could just general themes you are noticing in your work that for people like myself who had a a toe in these waters at one point in life and really don't as much anymore, what the encroachments, the issues that you really think are um, important to the you know secular civil society that I think you and I both treasure, what what are you noticing that um, you view as a real threat or concern? I'll, I'll tell you two things that come to mind because I really like that question. One is that when it comes to the Republican Party specifically, um, so much of what guides that party and inspires them is linked to religion. Mm. Um, so when we talk about Christian nationalism, like the leaders of the party, the ones who m are the loudest voices on that side are let's talk. I mean, you could talk about abortion, for example. They are guided to have these extreme abor anti abortion policies. Why? Because their religion tells them a fetus is a living being or whatever. If you mm. talk about trans rights, uh, LGBTQ rights in general, what is that guy? Why are they so worked up about those issues? It's usually because of religion. I think, And that's partly why it bothers me <laughs> internally when I see some atheist saying, oh, well, I can't vote for a Democrat or I'm a conservative. I mean, obviously, I don't agree with the religion thing, but I'm a conservative, so I would vote for Republicans because that's essentially a vote for Christian nationalism. They're mm -hmm. not even hiding it. They don't it, they don't even leave it to like conservative Christians to say this stuff out loud while they hide it like their playbook for if they win a trifecta of governance, the Project 2025. It says very clearly how they want to turn this into a Christian nation. So that's one thing where it's like you have an entire political party whose job it is in their minds. Their job is to infuse government with their religion and their religion only. And that should be disturbing to everybody. So that's one thing. Like everything is religious, it seems. The other thing I would point out is that so many religious people are on our side of the church state divide and on all these issues. And it's not because they agree with us on the atheism thing. Maybe they think we go too far on the religious criticism. But this is something that's been a pleasant surprise. There was a time when you and I kind of came into this world where atheism was a taboo word. You couldn't be a public atheist and have any hope in politics or anything like that. But these days, I have seen church state separation groups, literal, the American Humanist Association, American Atheists, Freedom from Religion Foundation, they will write briefs for the Supreme Court, basically saying, like, we don't we're not involved in this case, but we have a vested interest in how you rule. So here's arguments that we are making to the courts and your clerks to say, here's how you should decide this case because of these issues. Everyone does this, but they're writing those briefs. But when you see who's signing on to their briefs, they're usually not doing it solo, which is something they did a decade or two ago all the time. Now you will see they are writing that document and it's signed off by like progressive Christian groups, church state separation groups, Jewish groups, Hindu groups. Like there are so many religious groups that say, you know, we disagree about the religion thing. But on the matter of keeping the government out of this and letting us decide how to make this work in our lives, we want to see the following outcome. So the fact that we have so many more religious allies is mm. such a good change that to me, it's like, you know what? I, we'll let the God thing. That's such a low priority now because I don't care about convincing those people God doesn't exist so I don't have those conversations or debates or anything like that. I don't care. Are you on my side when it comes to this bill, this issue, civil rights? If you are, you know what? We'll save it for when we get drunk at a bar and we can argue about the God stuff later. 
Um, so that's that is an amazing change. I feel like so many of the stories I write these days that involve politics and religion, there are so many religious people who can read those stories or watch those videos or something. And it's like, okay, I, I'm not coming to it from an atheist perspective, but I agree with everything. Because mm-hmm. why wouldn't they? Because <laughs> nothing upsets Christians more than Christians who twist their faith and make it look really bad. That's mm-hmm. true of practicing Catholics. Like overwhelmingly, most Catholics in the United States are pro LGBTQ rights. They support abortion rights uh, and things like that, even though the Vatican obviously feels differently. It's like, yeah, a lot of religious people don't necessarily agree with the doctrine they're supposed to believe in. And who's fighting for that? It's us. It's the church state separation crowd. So that's been a surprising change that I've seen like over the course of several years. I probably should have started the conversation with this question because I, I've seen in preparation for this interview, you answer this. And I it is still, I think in some circles, such a loaded word, but the word atheist to you, what exactly does that mean to you? Sure. Uh, it means you don't believe in a higher power. I'm not saying definitively it doesn't exist. You can't know that, whatever. I'm just saying I don't think there's a God out there. I live my life as if there's no God out there. Um, but I, I've, I'm not the first person to say this. It is one answer to one question. Hmm. Atheism. Does God exist? Uh, no, I don't think so. Like, that's the end of it. After that, we can go many separate ways. I mean, if there's one thing we've seen over the past few years, it's that you've seen a lot of very prominent, well-known atheists take really different stances on trans issues and certain things like what counts as free speech, what doesn't. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, I'm almost tired, sick of what some very prominent atheists say, because guess what? We only have one thing in common. After that, they can go a lot of different ways. So it's, I can, I told you my definition of atheism. The downside of it is that's why it's so hard to bring atheists together around anything these days. Cause after you get past that one question, which is no longer that big of a priority, I think, for the reasons I mentioned, because you got religious groups that are siding with us on things. Why would I pick a fight with them over God? That mm. That's such a low priority. Um, it's, you know how uh, in 2012 and 2016, there were those reason rallies in Washington, yeah. D.C.? Yeah. I mean, if I don't think they're ever going to do it again, but if they had a reason rally in the summer of 2024, who the hell would you invite who stands for reason, you know, that people would get on board with and get excited about because you name a famous atheist. And I could tell you why people would be really opposed to thinking, no, they don't represent me. So, you know, for better or for worse, I mean, that's also true for Christians. That is also true for any religious group as well. Hmm. And I mean, dude, you are prolific online with the the amount of content that you put out into the, the public sphere. And you know, for you, just hearing your explanation there, I mean, I've, I've heard you say this years ago, that it is not your objective to convince other people that there is no God, that yeah. there seems to be a more important reason or reasons for the work that you do. And before I butcher what those reasons are, I think you've alluded to some of them. What does motivate you? You, you, t- you just talked about that you have a passion for these issues. Is it mostly for common decency and freedom, for lack of a better phrase, what is it, you know, fundamentally, what what would be the world in your mind that you would like to, to live in or to change based on the efforts? I almost wish we could go back to a time when we could just argue about God's existence. Mm. Uh, And we can't because there are bigger issues like that stuff invades our lives. Uh, It affects the policies that are passed at the state level, at the federal level. So if we have religious people on our side when it comes to church state separation and civil rights and things like that, then I don't know how you could argue about God's existence and treat those people as the other side when on the bigger priorities, they are right there with us. Um, So what motivates me? I mean, at this point, because I'm writing for myself, I'm not I it clicks don't matter. I'm not Mm. trying to cover everything because I can't. I feel like the, the thing I can add 
is there are stories that might be going on where I could provide a context that's you're not that you're not finding anywhere. I could provide additional elements to the story that maybe people are not seeing. Uh, for example, there was uh, the thing I posted about recently. One thing I posted about recently is that people were praising a priest online for cele- like for trashing the Trump endorsed Bible. And I saw people saying, listen to this clip. Here's a pastor just ripping it apart. Uh, saying this is a cheap stunt, basically. It's like, well, I actually listened to the sermon, and I don't think what he said is actually a a good thing to praise this guy for, because I actually listened to the context. Let Mm. me tell you what that context is, and maybe I can provide that element to the story. Or maybe there's a pastor saying something at a church that goes under the radar because we're so used to it. It's like, nope, let me bring some attention to what this person said at a church or what uh, something I was working on today is what's going on in a smaller town in Alabama that no one maybe knows about because it's local news. But maybe I can bring it to more people's attention because it does involve religion and it does involve uh, how what happens in a religious community when someone is is uh, lesbian or gay or something like that. So if I can provide that for people. Again, I go into everything now thinking my audience are not atheists. I'm not going to convince them to be atheists. But I hope that if you're religious and you're curious about the story, I hope that the perspective I give you is like you walk away from it thinking, oh, yeah, I mean, that seems right to me. Mm. And you know what? If that plants a seed in your mind (laughs) to be an atheist, great. Uh, But I won't know about it. But I think that's the best I can offer it. This is why I'm a really bad guest on like the atheist experience with Matt Dillahunty <laughs> and stuff, because like I don't care about the callers trying to argue God's existence. It's just mm. I, I don't think about it. I don't talk about it. I don't read about it. It's boring now to me. That's not trashing like the people who care about that stuff. Um, I just don't care. Mm. But if you want to talk about, hey, this is happening, they're trying to pass this law. Why is Mike Johnson dangerous, the Speaker of the House? Okay, I have thoughts about that. And I think I can argue those effectively. Um, So I feel like the nicest thing anyone can say to me at this point or the emails I get or something is from a religious person who says, you know, I am Christian, but there's this thing happening in my neck of the woods that I feel no one's covering this. The Christian media is not covering this. Uh, But maybe it's of interest to you. I'll give you an example, my favorite example in recent memory. Uh, This might have been a year and a half ago, but there was a church in Texas and they were known for putting on these big, it's a mega church. They put on these big theatrical productions with a Christian theme. Hmm. And like, there are some videos online of a different church doing something like this. Hilarious. Because it's like, oh, they put on these, they don't put on the nativity play. They put on like Star Wars, but Jesified or something. And those <laughs> videos are hilarious. But this church in Texas put together Hamilton the musical. And I thought, what, did they make a Christian version of Hamilton? Because like you can imagine, oh, youth group Hamilton's going to be insane and everyone's going to make fun of it. No, they put on the actual play Hamilton with the set with the costumes, with, I mean, yeah, they were amateurs, you could tell, but they were good amateur. Like, if a high school put that on, I'd say that was pretty damn good. Um, But the thing they did is they said, we're going to live stream this for two nights. And after night one, this is when word started spreading. I got a copy of night one's live stream. And then they said, we're not doing this tomorrow. And I don't know what happened there. But it's like, oh, but I have a copy of night one. And I could go through the video. It's like, well, I know (laughs) this is such a great mix of my worlds. I love theater. I love musicals. And obviously, I have a thing about religion. So it's like, wait, I'm going through the show. You could tell this verse changed. They made it PG because they didn't want to say this out loud. Oh, they changed this lyric to say like, hey, Eliza, you should find Jesus. Like they changed important verses to do stuff. And the kicker is at the end of the show. Why are they doing this? At the end of the show, the pastor comes on stage because he said, basically, we put on this so all of you would come to our church to come watch it. And all of you live streaming are watching this online. And now I want to tell you about Jesus. And in the midst of doing that, he basically says, I can we Jesus can fix you of whatever problems you have, like being gay. It's like, did you just tell a musical audience that there might be a problem with being? So, I mean, oh, my God, they're doing this thing. 
And that's the sort of thing that might have gone under the radar because churches put on shows like this all the time to lure in new customers. Um, But the fact that I could add to that and share the clips and show people, here's why this is a problem um, that actually made national news after a while to the point where like Lin-Manuel Miranda like had to address, we're getting lawyers on this because what they did is actually illegal. You cannot perform Hamilton uh, even with changes. It wasn't a parody. They were putting Mm -hmm. it on with Mm -hmm. some changes. What they did was illegal and they stopped because the lawyers were like, that's copyright infringement. You cannot do that legally. Like if a high school theater wanted to do Hamilton, the music, they can't. It's Mm -hmm. not available for sale yet. So anyway, that's just a thing where I'm like, oh my God, this this story was made for me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I can share it with an audience that understands the issues and again, when I'm talking about that, it's I'm not making fun of the kids. They're not the ones responsible for this. What I know, though, from theater is like you can't put on a show that good and that lengthy in like a couple of weeks. Yeah. People were doing this for months and you must have had professionals working on this for months. And you're telling me none of them realized this would be a problem. Like, come on. At that point, the church is screwing over those kids and putting them in a bad situation. That made me mad because these kids were talented, too. Hmm. You said, you know, a few minutes ago that the threat of Christian nationalism is, I think, one of the motivators for you and uh, uh, fighting against that. And it's one of the threats that you notice just in your day to day work. And maybe this was a microcosm of of that in some small way. But for, I think I have a rough understanding of what that means, but for people that are unfamiliar with the Christian nationalist movement, what would the world, what would our country look like if the reins of power were given over to, you know, this strand of thought, this strain of thought? And, um, I would love to have you paint that picture in as much detail as you would like. So let's separate the theocratic element. These people are not saying let's designate the United States. uh, Is a theocracy guided under Jesus? Like they're very openly, most of them are saying, no, 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 of course, that's not what we want. We have freedom of religion in this country. But imagine what conservative Christians push for when it comes to issues. What do they think about sex before marriage? What do they think about abortion? Gay people, trans people, trans people don't even exist in their minds. Uh, the environment, because uh, they think, whatever, we're just here temporarily. We're heading somewhere else as soon as we're raptured, right? So who cares about this world? It's mm. irrelevant. Those are beliefs that are commonplace in conservative con- Christian churches and evangelical mega churches. Like Joel Osteen doesn't talk about it, but that is what his church believes. You know what I mean? Those are things that you hear in conservative Christian churches. Now, imagine that the people who run those churches are writing our laws, and those laws are designed to emphasize everything they believe. So when you talk about abortion, it's, well, you can't have one. That's a policy that's not necessarily Christian. They don't have to say the word God in there, but they can design a policy and pass it in red states that says, well, this is murdering a fetus because our religion says, fetuses are people. So no one gets to have an abortion. Um, And we're going to criminalize it and punish anyone involved in it. That's Christian nationalism. Or saying that in history books, for example, we have to talk about how our founders were Christian. That's not true. But they can pass laws saying, well, we got to give homage to the Christian founding of our country. That's Christian nationalism. Um, When it comes to how, what do we do about trans people? Well, they don't think they exist. So anything that suggests trans people should have equal rights, using bathrooms on public property or in schools, things like that, those are no-goes. Again, when it comes to climate change, do you think the people in charge of those laws, if they're Republicans at this point, but if they're in red states, like, do you think they're going to do anything to ease us into clean energy, a clean energy future? No. Do you think they care about a Green New Deal? No. Do they care about anything climate related? No, because they just don't accept the science. I mean, again, back in my day, the science issue here was like evolution versus creationism and what should we teach? And now it's like they're still on that. They don't accept evolution, but they've lost the court battle But you know what they could do? They could just say, well, in the classroom, you still have to teach um, you have to teach that climate change 
is a hoax or you have not necessarily teach that, but to say there are holes in the argument, all those arguments like that, uh, we got to teach the strengths and weaknesses of climate science. Um, and then when you talk about sex education policies, these are the people saying we got to do abstinence only stuff. All of that is an example of Christian nationalism where the people writing the laws are saying, well, this is what my faith teaches me. So I'm going to put it into policy. Like kudos to someone like Joe Biden or kudos to the Democratic Party who might say, well, I'm Catholic and I don't personally accept abortion. I don't think you should have one. But as far as public policy goes, I support abortion rights. That's how it should be, because I'm not telling anybody how to live their life or how to make their decisions. I have a big problem when people go on like subreddits and make fun of Christians for living out like I'm a fundamentalist Christian. I have 15 kids. Do I find that weird? Yeah, but also whatever, not my business. I hope you take care of your kids. That's it. Versus the people who are like literally in Texas, they passed a law saying, we're going to give you a tax break that's going to go higher and higher if you have 10 kids. Hmm. Like that's the sort of that's putting a Christian belief into public policy. And again, some of these things might seem innocuous, but when they're doing it on issues that matter to a lot of people, it's not just people like us who have a problem with it. I would hope a lot of Christians, even those who agree with the positions, might say this is not what the government should be doing. And again, we need to get that message out because this doesn't just affect us. There are people who should be on our side who may not realize how big of a threat this is. Um, but if you are concerned, like you see, I don't want the country to be run like Alabama or Mississippi with its conservative Christian le uh, legislators then you should be concerned about this and you should vote accordingly. You have been in this world for a long, long time. And I, I to me, it's astonishing that the stamina that you've had in staying in this game, uh, per, you know, just personally, one of the things that I find after being in a movement for a few years is just the fatigue. Oh, yeah, the um, burnout. The burnout that, that hits, that makes it difficult to keep going. And I don't know if your fuel is um, just more robust than most people, and that's been able, what's been allowed uh, allowed you to continue in this world for so long. But the the areas of optimism, and maybe this is part of why you've been able to stay in this race for so long. But we've talked about some of the concerns, the the uh, the victories in your mind, the uh, what keeps you optimistic, what keeps you sure. going in this space. I'd love to hear about that. First of all, the burnout thing, I, I would love to say I don't tire of this stuff. I mean, you could tell why I'm motivated by this stuff, because this stuff does matter to me. Um, it's not that other activists are less motivated by it. It does help that I can do this full time. And so yeah. now it's not even a choice. Like, sorry, it's my job. I have to do it whether I like it or not. Mm -hmm. um, but the the when we talk about optimism, think about some of the things, if you go back like 20 years, the percentage of atheists in America, really low. And what have we seen? Every survey seems to show a huge rise in the number of people with no religious affiliation. They're not always atheists. But again, if you don't care about the word, who cares? More people are ditching organized religion for so many of the reasons we've been talking about for decades now. So that gives me optimism. Like, mm. even though Christian nationalism is a real threat, everyone else is kind of running away from all that. So these are maybe the last uh, Hail Mary cries of a dying audience of conservative Christians, but they do have a lot of power. Um, so, But I'm optimistic about that. Those battles of trying to convince people religion is bad for them, that it's not a virtue, we are winning that battle. So that is optimistic. Another thing that's really cool, this is maybe less covered, is the fact that it was very hard to get a read on who all these people are who are ditching religion, because atheists were always such a small fraction of the population that they were always an asterisk in every poll. No, there are now enough atheists out there and people who are non-religious that you can actually do a lot of surveys about who they are, what they believe. Like atheists are really good when it comes to voting. Like we vote more than the general population. We vote more than conservative Christians do. Now, there are fewer of us who so are not as powerful, but like we can get a sense of who we are and like, hey, politicians, you should talk to us and care about our issues. For that reason, here's another thing. How many atheists are in uh, Congress, for example, just to name one body? 
Um, back in my day, the answer was either zero or maybe in 2007, the answer was one. But guess what? Not only is there one openly humanist currently in Congress, there's now a congressional free thought caucus that mm. supports these things that has nearly two dozen members. And guess what? All of them but one are religious. But they say, oh, you want me to support atheist rights and against blasphemy laws and support freedom of religion, and we don't want religion influencing policy, we want data influencing policy. Why isn't everyone in that caucus? But the fact that all these people are like, free thought caucus? Sounds good. I'm in there. Now, they are all Democrats, but the fact that all of them but one are at least by label, they are religious. That's an amazing thing that it's no longer a taboo thing anymore. I've seen more people running for office who are openly non-religious. They may not use the word atheist, but a lot of them use agnostic or spiritual but not religious, or they say humanist or something like that, and they're winning seats. Mm -hmm. Like I think at last uh, two years ago when I did the last count with the help of the um, Center for Free Thought Equality, in 2022 midterms, after those midterms, there were maybe, I'm making this up, it's about 70 people who won seats for state office, like state rep, state senate, or congress, who were openly and explicitly non-religious. The answer used to be zero. The mm. fact that that number has raised by that much shows one, that they're not afraid of the label as much as they used to be, and maybe that gives other people incentive, but also that voters don't seem to think it's that big of a deal anymore either. So that gives me optimism. And I think going back to something we mentioned, the fact that there are so many resources now for people who may be questioning their faith, uh, people like you who are talking about this stuff, uh, again, YouTubers, TikTokers, uh, people writing about it, though there's less of them than there used to be. That's fine, though, because people are just shifting to new modes of communication. There are voices out there that are saying these things that need to be said, and even churches can't avoid it nowadays because a lot of the people speaking out are people who are members of those churches. And they're speaking as, like, I used to be a fundamentalist Christian. Here's my take on this stuff now. I used to be a Mormon. Here's what I'm saying about it now. Like, that's another reason for optimism, because you don't need a Richard Dawkins speaking for all atheists. You have a million mini Dawkins, which is the meanest thing I could call them. But like, <laughs> they're all speaking about the same stuff, but from their own perspectives and reaching audiences people like him never could. That's an amazing thing. Like, and that's not stopping. So that also gives me reason for hope. You and I obviously share a lot of uh, agreement with with many of these subjects. And, you know, I also know and I, I would guess you have thought quite a bit about this. It's probably in part what motivated you to get involved in this and this these uh, issues in the first place. But the and I, I would guess you're pretty familiar with the reports of um, the criticism about what has occurred in American society as people have left religion, where there is an increased sense of isolation, yeah. loneliness, lack of community, fueled additionally by the addictiveness of modern technology, which is everywhere, obviously. How do you respond to that criticism? It's really separate from the beliefs themselves and yeah. more about the loss of meaning and purpose and connectedness to other human beings. I've certainly seen that in my own life to some degree. I have too. Yeah. Well, how, how are you thinking about that? What What is the the path forward in your mind? How do you respond to that kind of criticism? I mean, I don't know that there's a good response because I think you're right. The one thing that religious organizations do really well is they bring together a lot of people. They have a sense of community that is hard to find elsewhere. It's a reason that you cannot as an atheist, you cannot just point out contradictions in the Bible and expect that people will just become atheists because what are you asking them to leave? Mm. Like their friend group, their social safety net, the thing that, you know, they look forward to on a Sunday morning, maybe. Because again, even if you don't love church sermons and there's a stereotype of them being really boring, guess what? After church, hanging out with the people that go there, that might be fun. So churches do community really well. But even though we want people to leave organized religion, um, 
first of all, I do think the lack of the whole bowling alone concept and the yep. lack of uh, social interactions and stuff. That's not a religion thing only that's happening everywhere. I have also found like, you know what? Yeah, we are on our phones much. But on the flip side, it's never been easier to find a community around things that actually matter to you. A lot of the people I grew up with who did atheist activism, they may not be doing it anymore. But guess what? They're really active in other causes that are adjacent to that. Because again, do you care about proving God doesn't exist? Maybe not. Do you care about church state separation and like fighting for progressives in elected office? A lot of them are. So they work on those causes. So even if you're leaving your church, you may find a common bond with people when it comes to issues that you care about. And guess what? It's never been easier to find those people and connect with those people. And even if it is online, I know that's not the same as an in-person community or something. And again, that's not specifically our fault, like as atheists. Um, but guess what? Those communities you find online are also strong in different ways. So I would love for people to have a better way of connecting with others in person in their community. Um, but the fact that church isn't the place where they're going, that doesn't strike me as a problem. Now, the the isolation is, but we're not solving, we're just introducing new problems if we say go back to church to find that community. Uh, you don't need church to have community. You need community to have community. And churches create, they present so many more problems than they seem to solve. So it doesn't bother me that we're asking people to ditch organized religion um, because I think they can find that collaborative communities in whatever it is they care about. Yeah. And it's better for all of us that they're not finding it at a church that may be spreading a lot of really vile beliefs in the process. I think it's a problem that or an issue, a, a nut that needs to be cracked and that we're kind of the guinea pig generation for a lot of this um, transition. Yeah. And for what to... it's worth, the attempts to create atheist communities have failed because guess what? It's not enough to just say we are brought together by our beliefs about God. Um, so there you go. Let's stick it together. It, that's not enough. you got to have passion about something. And for a lot of people, not believing in God is not a thing they're necessarily passionate about. But laws, policies, maybe uh, causes, maybe. So like it's better to organize around that stuff. Yeah, I think it's been about 15 years since we've last talked. And, you know, we are not old men, but we are getting older. And I, 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 I wonder if for people that are critical of your advocacy, your work, if they ever write into you and ask you, Hemet, you're clearly a smart guy. You're clearly a hardworking guy. Are you telling me that nothing in your 15 to 20 years of atheist advocacy has given you pause about your, your certainty about this? And you just you defined atheism earlier as not being a complete certainty in any in any way. Um, how do you respond to people who come to you with that line of questioning? One, I don't respond to them. Uh, two is, I mean, no, there's nothing I've seen in all my years of doing this that's made me reconsider the atheism thing. Mm. Um, now, there are plenty of atheists who have done stupid things that I'm like, oh, I hate that I'm associated with you. That's not new. Religious people do that all the time. Um, and I could speak out against that stuff, and I have. Um, but, like, I'm... <laughs> The the God issue? No, nothing's changed my mind. If anything, I've just become more passionate about why we need church-state separation. And hey, if religious people want to join me in that fight, as I think a lot of them should, then great. Let's work together on that. Um, I'm happy to say that that's true of a lot of the atheist organizations, that they have no qualms about working with religious groups when they are fighting certain battles. Hmm. Um, and they appreciate that the collaboration there too, like it's kind of nice when you could say, "Hey, this court, not necessarily the Supreme Court, but lower court too." It's not just us saying this. Here's the Jewish group that is also on our side when it comes to this issue. So, um, no, nothing's changed my mind. I don't try to argue this stuff online with anybody. Um, I I get a lot more emails from religious people who are just thanks for saying this. Or uh, I agree with you, but I am religious. And I'm like, I don't care. 
Like, I'm glad you agree with me. I'm glad we found common ground on that stuff. You go do whatever you want because I'm not keeping tabs on it. Hmm. Yeah. I know we're getting a little bit close to the end of the conversation. There are two things I would love to to close with. Um, I'd love to close with the the recent death of Dan Dennett, who is somebody I know we emailed a little bit about. Yeah. But before we do that, I would love to ask you, you know, it, in my reading of the online presence right now for atheism, you're clearly someone near the top of the information resource for the general public. Who else out there is, are people who you respect, who you go to for information? Who are the other thought leaders that you um, really like and would recommend to people who might be interested in them? Thought leaders is a tough one. And that I appreciate you saying all that. I don't know that I necessarily read other atheists because, again, the blogosphere for atheism has kind of disappeared over the years. Um, what I will say is there are people that I, I don't use TikTok, but I know there's a lot of atheists on TikTok who are really mm. good and effective mm. or former Christians, even if they're not atheists, who do a lot of good work. There are a lot of atheists on YouTube. Uh, genetically modified skeptic does a great job. There are uh, a, there are so many atheists on YouTube who make videos, they don't necessarily change my mind on the things because in general, we agree on a lot of stuff, but they present it in a way that makes me jealous because they're so good at how they do it. They're so welcoming. Um, there are more women, there are more people of color on those social media networks as well, which mm -hmm. is kind of great to see. I wish there was more of that. It is kind of surprising to me that so many of those voices who I'm like, oh, wow, that person was made a really good video or said this thing in a way that I did not, and I'm mad at, that I didn't think of it first or something. Um, and it's coming from those independent places. Like these are YouTubers doing it from home, podcasters doing it on their own front, as opposed to from necessarily the national organizations, uh, which may have a different focus or something. I, I don't know. I, I feel like when uh, I started in this world, like, and I'm not even knocking those organizations because I still work with them and I respect them quite a bit. But it's like they were the only voices representing atheists on any big scale. Um, and now that's just not true. So, you know, I'm, my advice is I don't have specific names because there are a lot and I would be remiss. I, I would forget a bunch of them. But if you're looking for people, search on YouTube, not just for atheists, but like for whatever element of it, church state separation, for this story, for a certain issue that you care about, you're going to find a lot of people saying stuff. This is also true on TikTok and Instagram and whatever. You're going to find people saying this stuff in a language that makes sense to you, because maybe my voice doesn't resonate with what some <laughs> someone who's younger than 30 is like, what is this man saying? Who? Fine. There are other people who are saying it too. Go listen to them. The fact that I can't tell you, oh, there's this one person you should all listen to. It's not because there's nobody out there. It's because there's so many of them out there. And you're going to find people you connect with. And if you're thinking, if you have opinions and you want to share it, the answer is good. Go friggin' start it and do it. And I hope a year later, you look back at what you made and you cringe because you're like, oh, how did I do this? And you put it this way or whatever. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how you grow. Go start doing it. It's going to suck at first. It's going to get better. But be that voice. Um, That's how you started. That's how I started. Um. And we have the benefit of having been in the game for a long time. But guess what? Uh, like, I'm just picking on TikTok because I don't use it, which is to say, like, well, guess what? That's really popular. And other people know how to do it really well. And I don't because I'm old. So mm. go find people on there because you will inevitably find really good people. And I find people will send me links to stuff. I find videos on there constantly. Uh, and I have no idea who the people are, but I'm like, that was amazing how they mm. said it, what they said. I love it. And now I got to find a way to incorporate that in whatever it is I'm doing. You know what I mean? So mm. uh, it's not that there are not big voices. It's that there are so many of them. You can find them. You will find people that resonate with you. One thing I would love to see, um, and I have made this push for uh, to the national organizations as well, is give some funding to people who are making those channels because that's the way you can get them making more of this stuff, which is give them the little bit of money they need to keep doing this without having to think about con like ad money all the time so that they can keep doing it. Because that's the thing that's preventing so many of these activists from continuing. It's that there isn't a lot of money in our world for this type of thing. Again, 
I found a way to navigate it, but I I feel like I'm one of the handful that have done that in our neck of the woods. It would be so much better if there were like, if you were Christian and you wanted to do it, there's no shortage of funding you could get if you wanted to start a church, if you wanted to make this content. There are people who will throw money at you. That He Gets Us campaign online is a hundred million dollar ad campaign for Jesus mm. who doesn't need money. It's like, how about I don't know, a fraction of that to people who make this type of content. Um, Like the fact that we have to struggle to find either advertisers or Patreon donors or whatever, like, man, stop making us fight for that. It's really hard. I wish people with means would support the sort of work a lot of these atheists are doing. Yeah, fair enough. And you mentioned the word welcoming earlier about, a, I think, a YouTuber that you really uh, appreciate. And I just want to say before we close with a, a section on Dennett, I mean, you, it's one of the things I've always admired about you is how welcoming and generous you are. Um, that has certainly been my experience with you over many years. I know we don't even know each other that well, but the way in which you were helpful to, to me, uh, as I was trying to get, you know, my book out there, I will never forget. And I, I'm sure that, uh, I speak for many people in, uh, appreciating your generosity and the, just the tone that you you bring to um, a lot of these subjects. So I wanted to oh, I just thank that. you for that, man. Um, and, and maybe we could close with a, a quick commentary on Dan Dennett, who I know is you know was one of the four horsemen. And for those who don't know that history, he was one of the four primary writers of the New Atheists who got a lot of attention in kind of the mid two thousands, and. He was the only one of the four that I actually ever got to to meet, and he recently died. I read your Substack about him, and I thought maybe it would be fun to just close on what I think you <laughs> feel is one of the most important legacies he's left, which is yeah. his work with the Clergy Project, yeah, um, which is not as well known, I think, in the popular culture as you know the the God delusion or the right. end of faith, but. I think has the possibility of being equally important over the long run. And so I want to just yeah. put that to you and, and maybe close with your comments on and, the clergy project and Dennett in general. Yeah. Dennett wrote this book, breaking the spell, which came out around that the era that those other books came out by those other authors. So he was lumped together with them. And that book is great. I've recommended it to a lot of people, but I think in like 2010, he worked on a research project with, an actual sociologist, Linda Lascola. And basically what they did is they spoke to people who were literally working as pastors, but who no longer believed in God. And it was just, it's not a survey. It's not a, a, a thing that you're going to say, well, we can estimate there are 15% of pastors who don't know. It's just saying, these are like five people we spoke to. They are currently working. We're using fake names because they don't want to be caught, but they don't believe in God. So why don't they believe in God? How are they dealing with this when they deliver a sermon every week, which is fascinating. And once they published that, I think they heard from more people who were like, wait a minute, I'm in that same boat. And that eventually led to the formation of a group called The Clergy Project, which was designed to, one, provide a safe forum where all these people, using all their fake names, could talk to each other about the struggles they were dealing with. And if there was an off-ramp, because they're like, I don't want to lie to people. I feel like I'm doing something good, but I don't believe it anymore. But also, this is my family's income. I mm. can't just quit. What do I do? Um, and so creating that safe place for them to talk and eventually give some of them the ability to say, I feel like I've graduated from the clergy project. I can come out and use my real name and say, I don't, I don't believe in this stuff. I used to be a pastor. And giving those voices a platform on which to share that, that was huge. That would not have happened without Daniel Dennett. I think in 2019, they announced they had a thousand people verified who were in their forums. I'm mm -hmm. sure, I don't know if that's grown or shrunk or whatever, but like, I don't think it's a surprise anymore to say, yeah, there are people preaching right now who don't believe in this stuff. Um, and we need to help them and give them a way out because they have skills, but their skills are tailored toward a church. And is there a way to use those skills or help them develop new ones so they can find a new vocation? Um, but again, I think that's what a legacy to leave behind, creating or helping create that project or lending your voice as a popular author of this stuff to say, this is an important thing. 
I want to make if if my fame has any credibility here, let me lend it to this project that is happening. And by the way, the clergy project has become, I think there was a documentary about it. It became an off-Broadway play where they shared like some of the, these actors were reading what some of these pastors had written and said. Um, and again, it's it's all about finding new ways to get the material out to more people. But that's that's the thing that uh, for all their uh, pros and cons, like the other new atheists did not do that. They may have promoted it, but like that's a huge legacy uh, for Daniel Dennett right there. Yeah, fair enough. I think that's a great place to close. Hemant Mehta, sure. wonderful to see you, man. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Dan.